Hi, and welcome to Conversations with Robin. Today's guest is a man who has had a profound effect on the spiritual awareness of millions of people on this planet. He's written something like 20 books, and he's in Australia at the moment promoting his movie, Conversations with God. Please welcome Neil Donald Walsh. Thank you, Robin. It's lovely to be here. And thank you, Neil, for coming on the program. Um, You're very kind to ask me. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's actually quite an honour. Our guests on Conversations with Robin have always been amazing. They're people that do great work in the world. I'm sure that's true. And having you, having read a number of your books, there are just so many questions to ask you. Well, ask away. Okay, firstly though, what's the response that you've had from audiences that uh, have seen your movie? Well, you know, it's a difficult question to answer. Nobody comes up to me and says, I hated the film. <laughs> So I really don't, don't have any way of knowing objectively, but subjectively, people seem to love it. They mm -hmm. seem to be touched by it. They seem to feel that it brings a very important and meaningful message, a message that has touched their lives deeply. And uh, I'm very, very grateful for that, profoundly grateful. Okay. How accurate is the film to that part of your life? Because I noticed at the end of the, the movie that it says about obviously you've had to honor people's identities, etc. Is sure. it, how true is it to your journey, that part of your well, life? Well, I, I think it, I think what's on film is very true. Mm. I don't think that it shows, as it, as the movie indicates, everything that there could be shown during that period of my life because um, there's there's much there's much you can put into a movie, but only so much people will watch. Mm -hmm. In other words, you've got to get the movie done in 120 minutes or something of that nature or less. This is, I think, a 111 minute film, roughly. And um, so you reach a point of diminishing returns where people simply aren't going to sit there any longer unless it's a major epic with lots of action. So uh, what's on screen is by and large um, exactly what happened. Now, uh, in a few instances, some of the characters in the movie and some of the uh, scene sequences were kind of crushed together, a bit squinched together, because for again, for the same reason. You couldn't take all the characters that people your life or mine and put them uh, on, a, mm. on an hour and a half film because there'd be characters flying all over the place and you wouldn't be able to tell anyone from anyone else. So sometimes we've taken a one or two characters and squinched them into a single person or three or four characters and done that in order to get across the essence of what happened there. That, that's, that's, that wasn't done a lot in this film, but it was done, I think, in two or three cases. Most of the individual characters are people that I actually interacted with in the ways that I did. What happened, Robin, is that the screenwriter sat down with me for about um, three or four days initially, and then through the months he would come back to Ashland, where I live. He lived in Los Angeles. Uh, and interview me again, and he got many, many hours of tape uh, comments on my life and what happened then, well, what happened then, and, and asking me all about the sequences of my life. And then he went down, back down to Hollywood, and he wrote his first draft of the script. I had a chance to review that and had a chance to review all the drafts of the script to make sure that nothing was in the movie that was um, either manufactured or exaggerated or st strained credibility. But in the, in the one or two places where they played it just a bit with the sequencing. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, the, the scene in the movie where I signed the contract, where I agree to the terms of the book, that did, did take place at an airport. From the million to the million and a half? Yes. Wow. That, did, that, that did take place at an airport, but it took place at an airport conference room mm -hmm. rather than an airport restaurant. But the director said, you know, conference rooms are not very sexy to put on mm -hmm. film. We could just four walls and a couple of glasses on the table. We, we can't film there. It's going to be nothing. We've got to have some visual content. Can we move that? They asked my permission. Can we move that same scene into a restaurant where at least we have some waitresses going by and some glasses tinkling and some sense of life mm -hmm. ha happening rather than a, a dead quiet conference room? I said, sure. In addition, the sequencing was crunched down because the next um, uh, offer came the next day. We a million to the million yeah, and a half. We, yep. we actually left the table, and I actually got on a plane and, and went away. And the next day, um, the, the, the character of the, uh, the Sharon Parker character called back and said, "You know, a million and a half." And so, uh, it, but we had a, we had to place that that counter offer right there in the same sequence because mm. it just doesn't dramatically doesn't work. So those kinds of small licenses for artistic effect that don't change really the the content. Uh, so much as just some of the sequencing. Movies do that and they have to do that or, or you'll never get any story ever made. Okay, well just, just on that part, I mean the character that played you in the movie, 
his facial expressions were so amazing. When she mentioned a million, and what was the gentleman's name who was your agent at that stage? Well, he was my publisher, your Bob, publisher? Bob Friedman. Bob. And Bob's, you know, playing the game and kind of nudging onto the table. I mean, how were you feeling in here, given what had happened to you with, you know, no money and then moving back just up? Just the way he was with showing. A million dollars, you'd be going, yeah, just the way. I take it. Yeah, of course, that's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. You know, I, I could not believe it. When, when she said, um, we're prepared to offer you, I thought she may, something, may say something impressive, but mm -hmm. modest, mm -hmm. $150,000, $200,000. Mm -hmm. When she said a million dollars, I almost fell out of my seat. <laughs> and then he says no. Yeah, and, he, and, and he did kick me under the table. Yeah. I mean, I, I was telling the, the screenwriter exactly what happened there, so mm -hmm. he wrote that all in. And I, I, he actually kicked me under the table, and I was realizing I have to be cool here and mm -hmm. pretend like she said nothing. You know, and I, try, I tried very hard to do that, but I think she saw that I was a bit taken aback. <laughs> And, and then, you know, just as true to form, true to the script, he's, you know, Bob Friedman said, that, you know, we can do that on our own. Mm. Uh, we'll, mm. you, you have to do better than that. Yeah. You know, and I sat there and thought, this man just blew off a million dollar <laughs> offer. And those don't come along very often in your life, and she's going to walk out of here, and that'll be the end of that. But he, I think, had a sense of um, how to put this gently, what the traffic would bear. Yeah. And I think he understood that, Sim that um, the Putnam Publishing people really wanted this book. Yeah and that he, he knew enough about the business to know they weren't uh, beginning their offer. They were, their starting offer was not their last offer. Mm. So he was um, you know, a businessman enough to say no mm. when I would have just jumped right at it. Yeah. Um, but that's how it happened. Mm. Amazing, amazing. Oh, it is. So why did you actually make the movie? What, what's the outcome for having made the movie? I wanted to share a message with the world that God talks to all people mm -hmm. all the time that it wasn't something that happens just to me. I wanted people to understand that I really represent James Thurber's everyman. And that uh, if they saw my story, they would be able to understand that this can happen to anybody and is happening to everyone all the time. So I felt that there was some value, not only in sharing the messages from the book, which there are many in the entire movie, not just in the one sequence, but throughout the film, but also some value in seeing the story of one person who had this experience so that they could identify with that person. In addition, there was kind of a secondary fallout that I really didn't expect, but I know now it's happening everywhere. People are having, people who watch the film are having a whole different idea about the homeless. Mm -hmm. I've had many emails, many emails from people saying, I will never look at a homeless person in the same way again, thanks to your film. Mm. So that wasn't something I think I deliberately planned, but one of those delicious side effects that happen sometimes in life when you don't have any ulterior motive other than to do it the best you can in what the moment will allow. Mm. Well, let me ask you a couple of questions around that time because we did a program going back a while now on Sydney's homeless and some of the, um, the information that came out of that particular program was the absolute smell that a human body has when it's not washed for a long period of time. I know how hard the ground is when there's nothing but a piece of cardboard and how many bones that in the human body that can ache. When you were homeless, in that movie it appeared like um, it was, at least there was a band of people and some sort of you know, tents and, and eating facilities. Because I was how lucky accurate enough, was that? It's yeah. very accurate because yeah. I was lucky enough to find a park mm -hmm. uh, in just, just about um, Oh, I guess three or four miles outside of downtown Ashland, Oregon, where uh, it was it was originally intended as a campground mm -hmm. for 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 campers. You know, just as the man says in the movie, you guys are professional campers around here. And I, you know, I said to him, Pro professional campers. I said, yeah, people who come in usually on foot and stay for a very long time. Uh, but the campground owners um, were generous enough to allow people if they could pay the, the $25 a week uh, uh, tenting fee uh, to, to hang out. But th the one, one interesting thing was that um, if they didn't pay that fee, or if they missed it by, by, you know, by a dollar or so, they were out. He, he, he did require that you pay the fee, just as the character in the film says, if you don't have it on Friday, you're, you're gone. Do we, he says to me, All right, do we understand each other? Yes, sir. Mm. So that was a way to separate the wheat from the chaff at least a little bit, that those who, who weren't willing to at least get out and do what they had to do to, to bring in that 25 or $30 a week to stay alive uh, were, not, were not going to be allowed to be there. 
But I was lucky enough. This park still exists, by the way. It's a real place just outside of Ashland. I can take you there. And uh, people still stay there uh, from time to time who don't have any other place to go. Well, at the end of the movie, you went there and there's a for sale sign on it. Yes, well, it was sold. Oh, but it still is maintained. Yes, it was, okay. somebody else bought it. Yeah. There's an interesting story behind that that you might find just unfathomable. I almost bought it. You know, we were wondering that when we saw the movie. Yeah. If you had, we're going to take a break, Neil, yeah. and when we come back, find out more about that. Because okay. I wondered if actually you had. Yeah. <laughs> back with you soon. Okay, and welcome back. And we're having a conversation with Neil Donald Walsh. And Neil, before the break, we're talking about that park. You said that you were contemplating buying it. What would you have done with it? Well, I was looking around. It was after the book had uh, done very well, mm -hmm. and I was beginning to receive royalty checks, and they were not small checks. And I started calling real estate agents because I wanted to take the income that had been earned from those movies, or, I mean from those books, and uh, put them into something that would have lasting value, and that I wouldn't just you know, squander the money, because mm. I had never seen that kind of money in my life, as you can imagine. <laughs> Me so, neither. So, so well, most people haven't. <laughs> you know, it's just a, a dream come true for anybody, really. Mm. So um, in any event, I was, try I was thinking of establishing a, an intentional community, and then finding a place where I could invite anybody to come in, and the honest truth is I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't even require $25 a week. I would just let it be open to anybody. We'd have some ground rules. I would sit down and talk to the fellas and say, "Okay, guys, here's the story. Mm. You, you can't hurt me here. You got to be, you got to be straight up with me and play square and try not to do anything illegal that gets me in trouble. But if we can play square with each other, you can stay here." That was the thought I had. Mm -hmm. Well, the um, I didn't think about this place though. Interestingly enough, I never because I didn't know it was available. I didn't know it was for sale in real life. The agent took me around, and 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 uh, there it was for sale. Oh my God. Again. Mm. It had been turned over two or three times and uh, drove into that driveway and I thought, oh my heavens, mm. can this be surreal or real? I'm standing here with the ability to buy this entire park where a couple of years ago I had to scrape together enough uh, coins to just stay on four square feet mm. of it. Mm. So it was... Um, and the bus fare to get out of there to go yeah. for that interview. Oh, a huge thing. You know, oh. when, when you're, um, Robin, when you're on the street, mm -hmm. getting off the street is virtually impossible because not only do you smell bad and look bad, but you can't even pull together the $2 it takes to get the bus fare to go to a job interview if you had a job interview. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's to the average person, it seems like, what's the big deal? Why don't those people just get a job like the rest of us? Once you're in that situation, getting out of there is unbelievably difficult. You've got to pull together what to a street person is a fortune mm. just to go to a job interview. Mm. Get, a, get, a, you know, get, a, get a shower someplace, wherever you can find a place to get a shower. Now, I was fortunate because the park that I was in actually had public showers there because it was a public campground. Yeah. So they had public showers. So what guys will do on the street, if they can find a nearby um, public park or a camp facility, they'll walk there if they have to, once a week anyway, and jump into the into the public showers and, and grab a quick shower. Mm. Maybe even wash their clothes a little bit and bring some extra clothing and wash it in the sink or whatever. Take it back all crushed up. They don't care about ironing, but they hang it out to dry back over a tree limb or something when they're back at camp. And they've semi clean mm. for the next 10 days. So it's, uh, what, it's not an easy one, way to live. one step above, I guess, being on the street. Unless yes, it's, it's probably one, not. Yeah, not, a, not an easy way to live. Yeah. Well, going back further on your journey before that, Neil, um, you got brothers and sisters? Like yeah, yes, yeah? yes. Well, I, I, I did. Um, all but one of them has passed away. But I had, um, I had three brothers, no sisters. Mm -hmm. um, you the oldest, or? No, I was the youngest, actually. Oh, you're the baby. Yeah. Okay. And your mum and dad, what sort of work did they do? My father was um, in the post office for many years in the United States, and he was a labor leader. He was a, uh, um, a union leader uh, in the postal union in the U.S., uh, and he worked at the post office for more than 40 years, I think 43 or 45 years, retired after all those years, ultimately retired from management. He ultimately left the union and became part of, part of management, and he was a postal supervisor in the last 10 or 12 years of his working life. My mom was a homemaker. She died at my age now. Mm -hmm. I often think about that. 
uh, when I get up in the morning. My mother didn't live longer than I am old now. I seem so young to myself. And I think to myself, gosh, if my mom felt about her life the way I feel about my life now, she must have felt when she was ready to die. I've only just begun. Mm -hmm. It can't be over this fast. If somebody told me that I was going to die this year, which could happen, of course, but if I knew in advance, I would think, oh my gosh, I thought I had at least 10 or 15 or 20 years or more left here to finish it up, tidy it up, get done those last things I really wanted to get done, experience those things I wanted to experience. My mother didn't have that opportunity. She died at 63, which is how old I am. Mm -hmm. But she was a wonderful mother, a wonderful homemaker. She never worked outside of the house. She spent her whole life raising her children. She was an angel. You said that actually in the, um, the acknowledgments for book one of Conversations with God, that she was the first angel you met. Yeah. Yeah. That, that um, scene in the movie, uh, yourself as a little boy and your mum, what was that symbology? What was that to do with? Well, my mother fancied herself to be a mystic. I think she was a mystic, actually. Okay. Uh, and she did a lot of work in that area at a time in our culture when it was not popular or not so accepted to do that. These days, it's almost de rigueur at, at mm. some level. Uh, but in those days, back in the uh, 1940s or 1950s, it was not decidedly not acceptable. So she would do you know, card readings or read people's palms or whatever, um, almost on the sly, as it were. Uh, she'd bring in her relatives and friends and people from down the street, and they were not, not to tell anyone, not to really let the word go out too far, because she'd be ridiculed. But one thing she did was um, palm reading, and I watched her do that from the time I was three and four years old. She had people come in, she earned a few extra pennies. They used to leave, she never charged anyone, but they would leave you know, a little bit of money. Not a lot, but she'd make some pin money for herself that way. And she enjoyed doing it because she felt she was being of service to people who really wanted to have some other insight into their life. So I watched her do this, you see, at my kitchen table for, for years. And every day I would say, every so often I would say, read my, read my palms, mom. And she'd say, oh, no, no, honey, when you're older, when, when you're a bit older, when you can understand more. Well, finally one day, I was about eight or nine, I think I just begged her to the point where she couldn't say no. I said, come on, Mom, you've been telling me for a long time, just read my palms. And uh, poor dear, she looked down and meaning nothing by it. But if you look at my palms, I have headlines that go clear across both hands. Yeah. They're very unusual. When I've gone to professional palm readers, they look at them and they have the same astonishment that my mother did. Even a professional palm reader today would look at this and say, well, I've seen one hand like that, but never two. So it looks as if you have no heart line on either hand. Uh -huh. And I said to, to uh, her, as I've said to palm readers, well, what does that mean? And they've said, well, it means you know, you'll never love anybody in the classic sense. You love people with your mind. Mm -hmm. It's a mental, largely a mental process with you, but it's not something you get all emotionally caught up in. Well, when my mother told me that at, at eight, eight and a half or nine years old, you, uh, she said, baby, you'll never love anybody. There was more, of course, to the story. Sure. The, the scene didn't end there in real life. Yeah. But I, I said to her, well, well, what does that mean? She said, well, it means that you'll, you're different from the rest of us, and you experience life differently. And you experience life, and you look at life, and, and you explore life largely as a deep, deep, deep mental process, not as an emotional process. And that's how you'll experience love as well. So don't be surprised if you, don't, you have a difficult time in your life getting all emotionally caught up in the drama around love relationships. To you, it be, will be largely a pretty much cut and dried mental experience. And, and loving people, in your case, will be a decision, a choice you will make, not an uncontrollable head over heels kind of a thing. So she explained that to me. Well, I, I, you know, that, that affected me. She didn't intend to damage me in any way. Mothers never do, parents never do. But I heard that in a different way than she sent it to me. So my, what the movie tried to depict was the impact that that one sentence had on me in my life, because from that day on, every time I got into a relationship with a woman, those words echoed in my ear. You know, it's a, you know, you'll never love anybody. You'll mm -hmm. never love anybody. So mm -hmm. from the time I was 16 on, into my puberty, right through to my 50th and 60th year, I would look at women and uh, immediately have that, that thought in my head. So of course I got into, why bother? Mm -hmm. Why try? It's not going to work anyway. Mm -hmm. They can't, they'll never, and uh, some of my relationships were in a sense do doomed from the start because I was just playing out my mother's prediction. That's what they were trying to show in the movie. Wow, that's huge. We'll take another break and we'll come back and find out more about Neil's journey and the work in his world.
back with you soon. Thank you for coming back with us and just finding out more about Neil and his life journey. So Neil, um, I know with your when you're out here back in, gosh, I think it was 2003, your Banquet of the Soul with Tom Hartman. I was there, amazing day with both of you. And you were sharing about when you came home, uh, wife and kids gone, furniture gone, and you know, raced upstairs, her clothes are gone, yours are there, and you're gone, oh, the robber was a female. I mean, as you said, the mind tries to make sense. How many children have you, have you had? I have nine children. How many? Nine. Nine? Wow. To the one woman? No, no, no. No one would have put up with me that way. <laughs> that, that, not even remotely possible. Gosh, nine children? Yeah. From what ages? Well, the youngest is now um, 16. Yeah. Uh, and the oldest are uh, in their mid-40s, in their early 40s, 42, 43. So what do they think of what Dad does in the world? You'd have to ask them, really. Yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't presume to, I mean, from what they tell me, but again, like the moviegoers, nobody yep. says, Dad, you know, you're nuts. Yeah. So, um, I mean, they don't do it often anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, I, but I, I presume that they're um, feeling good about all that's occurred in, in my life. Mm -hmm. Several of them have made it clear to me that they're very proud. Mm -hmm. uh, of, of me, I guess. It's a difficult question to answer because it sounds so self-serving. Mm. But I, I think that my children are uh, happy for me and happy for themselves at, at all that's happened. Are you fairly protective of that part of your life? Uh, because than, everything more than, else... More than fairly protective. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have, you have to understand, very few areas of my life anymore, very few moments in my life that are private. Mm. I mean, I... Let me tell you how extreme it is. I was in uh, Los Angeles three years ago to do a uh, Body Mind Spirit Festival or Body Mind Spirit Conference there. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, I walk in at a place like that, everybody knows me. I'm not a widely known on the street, but at a place like that, everybody. You know, there were 10,000 people there and they all knew me. Mm. So there was no place to hide and I didn't expect to be able to hide there. I understand what, what the game is, but at least I thought I could enjoy a few moments peace in the men's room. But no, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm in the men's room, in the stall, and underneath the stall door comes a book, Mr. Walsh, would you mind? And I thought, my life has just ended. Mm -hmm. I can't even be in this private place in this private way without somebody asking for my autograph. So I, I realized that um, I could no longer experience life in any rational way. If I step out of my house, so I, uh, I've had to have a new idea what life is going to be about for me. This may seem like a strange question. I, mean, I, was, at, I was at the hotel in Sydney just the other day. I mean, I'm in the other side of the world from where I live. Yeah. A strange person walks up to me in the middle of the hotel lobby in Sydney, Australia, and says, "You're Neil Donald Walsh," and I said, "That's exactly right. That's who I am." <laughs> Um, and so I realized, uh, and of course she wanted to converse with me and get some, how do I put this gently, FaceTime. And I understand that. I mm. do understand. Mm. All of us who have placed ourselves in the public spotlight know what it is that we're doing. Nobody's breaking our, you know, twisting our arm to do it. But I don't think that um, any of us could really realize ultimately the extent to which uh, your privacy evaporates, completely disappears. So I have promised my um, various wives and uh, my various children. How many wives have I've you? Had six, I've been married six times. And I've, I've promised all of them that I would not invade their privacy. One of them asked me, because we're all good friends, all of us, but one of them called me when the book started really selling and she mm -hmm. said, could you, is there any way mm -hmm. you could keep me out of that spotlight mm -hmm. as your as your last gift to me. Mm. So I've made that promise. And, and fair enough. And that leads me to this next question, which may sound like a strange one. Any regrets? I mean... Oh my God, in my life you mean? No. I'm, I know when the Banquet of the Soul, you said you had many. In, in getting this work out there and getting these books out there... No, no and, regrets regarding that. Yeah. 
No, I. Uh, so the loss of loss of personal, you know. You know what? Yeah. I was having dinner once with uh, Shirley MacLaine. I, I shouldn't name drop, but. Oh, please do. She's one of my other favorite writers. Well, et you know, she'll probably she'll say, Neil, <laughs> did you have to do that? Uh, but we are friends, and she had me to her place once in Malibu, and we were just enjoying a quiet dinner together. She was in mm -hmm. the kitchen rustling up some um, veggies for us. You know, mm -hmm. we sat down on the floor. She has a very low table. Uh, it's a floor table actually. We sat down on the floor and started chomping on our veggies and she, she said so how's it going and I told her a story similar to the one I just told you I said oh mm -hmm. man you know I've I just completely lost my privacy and I I can't live life the way I used to anymore she stopped me in the middle of it you know, this is I'm telling this to Shirley MacLaine for God's sake mm -hmm. she can't walk down the streets of Timbuktu yeah. without being instantly recognized by everybody you know she just pulled me to her put my face right next to hers and she said is that your biggest complaint <laughs> She said, Neil, grow up. Uh, you know, God has given you this wonderful, wonderful world stage. And if you want a world stage in which to send a world-changing message, it, that's a small price to pay. And I looked at her and I started to cry. I mean, just tears came to my face. I said, yeah. Shirley, thank you for waking me up. Because, you know, so no, I don't have any regrets about it. I simply notice it. Mm -hmm. And I notice it sometimes with a bit of emotion because I don't think my life is the way I thought it was going to be, mm. but not with regret. Mm. No, I, I can't regret something that's touched the lives of millions and millions of people, and many of those people have told me that it's touched their lives in such a positive way that it's changed their lives forever. I can only get down on my knees and say thank you, God, for letting me be part of this, mm. even though I scarcely deserve it. Well, we won't go down to that one because, gosh, having seen that movie, I had no idea you were homeless for that long <laughs> and what you went through. Yeah, it was an interesting journey. Mm. Given um, the books that you've written and the life that you've been leading since writing those books, so many people out there doing the work in the world at the high level profile that you are and, and on this spiritual type level, do you find your buttons still get pressed and when they do how do you handle it my buttons get pressed all the time but mm. but they uh, kind of flip back to center very quickly mm -hmm. uh, i think i get annoyed or upset or frustrated especially when i'm tired which is a lot mm. uh, because my schedule is very rigorous when i'm on the road uh, my buttons get pressed as fast as anybody else's maybe even a bit faster but what i notice is I don't stay in a place of anger or upset or annoyance for more than a few moments, literally six, five or six minutes. Whereas in the old days, if something bothered me, if something happened untoward and I was not pleased with it, I could stay there for the rest of the day, sometimes the rest of the weekend. I mean, we just linger there and, and kind of fester there and I would be with that for far longer than I needed to. So what I notice now is that I experience that, I give myself permission to be human and just to have that whether it's at the front desk of a hotel where they don't have my reservations or at, the, at an airline counter or some reporter who's just being way out of line or whatever it might be or, or some person in an autograph line is terribly cheeky. They've been told bring two books and they put eight or ten, I mean literally a shopping bag full, say, would you mind Mr. Walsh? And I sometimes take a deep breath and say, well actually you're a bit out of bounds. There's a whole line of people here, 150 people and you know, how about if I do too, you know? Uh, I, um, I find myself getting annoyed like anybody else, but uh, Robin, uh, I've learned to move through that very, very quickly. Mm. And I get right back to center very fast so that nothing uh, bothers me anymore except for a very short period of time. And, and I have no lingering resentments about anything or anybody. Any old resentments or angers that I had in my life have long since disappeared and been healed. And the result of that is that I live in a fairly tranquil place emotionally, by and large. Mm. There was a scene, and I guess that's bridging onto this next question, there was a scene in the movie where that woman came in who had the adopted son and um, found out that he was adopted and they said, well, when you're 18, we will find your mum. And of course he had the motorbike accident. Excuse me. Yep. And, um, and passed away. 
And, and when she came in to the talk that you were giving and you found yourself saying to her, because she couldn't make sense of it all, his mother passed away two years prior and he was meeting his mum. Yeah. And according to the movie, that was such a shock for you. It's like, where did that information come that, from? That happened exactly that way. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't at a bookstore, it was at a retreat. Mm -hmm. That's another one of those little uh, artistic adjustments, but the experience was sure. precisely the same. In fact, the uh, screenwriter took the dialogue right out of my mouth, actually. Mm -hmm. He said, well, what did she say? What did you say? What did she say? What did you say? And, and uh, he was writing it all down. Um, so that, that scene happened exactly that way in terms of its content. It occurred at a retreat, on the, in the, on the last day of a retreat, in actually the last hour of a retreat. Uh, and. Um, they placed it at a bookstore because it was easier to film rather than try to find a retreat center and put 80 or 100 people in there and get all the extras and all the lighting and stuff. It was So it was far easier for them to go to this bookstore where they were shooting a previous scene anyway. They just went to a different location in the same Barnes and Noble mm -hmm. and set it up. So they were able to do two, two scenes at once and, and, uh, and for e economy of location did it there. But the experience was exactly as it was, um, as it was filmed. And I was shocked, of course. I was, I had no idea where that came from. And I did step outside. Uh, we took a break then, because the audience was stunned. And I stepped outside, and I did say those words. Where did that come from? Where did that come from? And, uh, and those around me said, well, you, know where, you know where it came from. Mm. I said, OK, well then book the extra days in Russia. That, that actually happened just that way. I was planning to do a, a European tour and someone had, from Russia had asked if I could squeeze in you know, four or five days in Moscow since I was so close, relatively speaking. And I was upset about that. I said, you know, come on, I've been gone already enough. But after that happened, I realized that my, my life was not about <laughs> going bowling or cutting the grass or having a barbie out and back. It was about going to Russia. Okay, we'll take a break because I'd like to ask some more around that particular incident. Back with you. Welcome back. And Neil, in the last segment, that uh, part where you got this information that his mum, his birth mum, uh, had passed away two years earlier, do you find that you more and more have moments where you get those insights into someone else's life? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Uh, the process is one of getting myself out of the way. Mm -hmm. What I say to myself when I'm asked questions like that, which I'm asked increasingly mm -hmm. wherever I go, because people, you know, think of me as this is the guy who talks to God. Mm -hmm. By the way, we all talk to God. Mm -hmm. I want to make that point mm -hmm. before I leave this chair. Yeah. But people think it's about me and not all of us. And so they increasingly ask me questions like that. Um, and when someone does, my first reaction is to go deep inside and to say, okay, God, um, obviously there's something you want this person to know now. What is it? And uh, allow me to get myself out of the way and just become clear about what it is. Let me be an amplifier for this other person's voice. Because, you know, generally speaking, Robin, we're all talking to ourselves, using someone else as the amplifier of our own wisdom. And so that's, the, what, that's true, certainly in this case, and in, in cases like this. People uh, probably already know many of their own answers, but they either haven't found a way to um, access them or haven't found a way to believe them. Mm -hmm. So I usually get very quiet for a moment, and I, I just kind of ask God, OK, if there was something this person's trying to tell him or herself here, what would it be? I try to get myself out of the way. And, and then I say the first thing that comes to my mind without judgment, without thinking too much about it, uh, without trying to add content or even thinking about the content. I just, I've learned to just blurt it out. And that's just been an astonishing process. Mm, I wondered that when I watched that particular segment. Where do you think we are at on this planet in the balance between love and fear? Where are we at compared to say where we were at when you first started writing book one? I think that we're at a, a wonderful place. Uh, I see the world moving closer and closer 
to its own spectacular healing. Mm -hmm. I see humanity just stepping, now by leaps and bounds, toward the paradise on earth of which it has dreamt for many, many centuries, even for millennia. I think we're right on the cusp of that. But because we're right now on the cusp of that, I think that this is also a potentially dangerous time. Because as happens at all moments like this, when history is about to change course radically, as happened the last time uh, on this earth in, uh, during the period of the Renaissance, there will be those who believe that any, any shift or change in the fundamental ground of being of humanity uh, is unwelcome, undesirable, and so they will oppose it. And um, they will oppose it in some cases by any means, fair or unfair, mm -hmm. uh, violent or nonviolent. They will oppose it. So I, I see that we are approaching a time where there will be some level of clash mm -hmm. between, I want to say, yesterday and tomorrow uh, in all areas of human endeavor, not simply in. Um, not, not simply with regard to uh, religion or spirituality, but governance, education, commerce, and the way we do our economies, uh, human sexuality, the arts, and uh, just as happened during the Renaissance, by the way, all those things changed during the Renaissance as well. The Renaissance, of course, took 300 years to create those changes. I think that these uh, shifts will occur at this time in around 30 years, about one-tenth the time because of the exponential increase in the way, in the speed with which information is shared by peoples of the earth, and the increase in the way that, in the rate at which uh, new solutions and new ways of doing things are found and are employed uh, throughout the world in every field of human endeavor, um, the sciences, medicine, technology, and of course in spirituality as well. So Robin, I think in the next uh, 30 years or so, we will create a brand new way to be human. And I think we're right on the verge of that now. So we're now 2007, so we're talking about 2037. Yeah, 2037, 2040. I think we'll find, uh, as we begin to approach the midpoint of this century, that we're looking at uh, a whole new world. Hopefully not Aldous Huxley's brave new world, mm -hmm. but a whole new world where we have new ideas about God, about life, and about each other and about who we are, about why we're here on the earth, and about the whole process that we're undergoing. Okay. In all the travels that you do and all the questions that you're asked, what would be the one or two questions you're most asked? <laughs> that, you know, the viewers out there could be going, well, ask him this question. I mean, so much is answered in your books, and yet. Well. I'm, I'm almost always asked, why you? Uh, and I try to tell people that it isn't me. It's everybody. And so my, my usual answer to that is, why not you? Um, that God is talking to all people all the time. I'm also asked, uh, what is God's message to the world? If you actually talk to God, what is God's message to the world? I mean, if you had a statement that he wants to make for all humankind, uh, what, is, what is the statement? And I usually have a five-word answer to that, which I gave in the film. Mm -hmm. You've got me all wrong. Mm -hmm. So I think people really, but mostly people want to understand the individual incidents in their own lives. What I've dis discovered is that when people ask me questions out of an audience, they almost always ask me questions having to do with individual incidents in their own lives. How can I find my life purpose? That's a big question. I get asked that a lot. How can I uh, create a better relationship? How do I deal with this uh, particular circumstance in my life, an illness or the loss of a job or whatever? People tend to be concerned and involved to a very large degree with their own day-to-day -day experience. I don't say that pejoratively. I just simply notice it. What I attempt to do is, is to help people to understand that life is much broader, much more expansive, and, and certainly much more, how do I say this, um, important than one's nine-to-five on-the-ground experience, the individual dramas of our life. 
I find it very difficult to stay connected to, to life in that way. I don't have individual dramas anymore that last more than seven minutes. I call it Neil's seven-minute drama, and it's over. <laughs> I, I can't stay with it. I can't stay with it. I can be there. Mm -hmm. I can be, as I said before, just as annoyed or upset as the next person, but not for much more than about six or seven minutes. I can't hold it. I can't stay there. I know too much. And I want too much, frankly, out mm -hmm. of life. I want too much joy. I want too much peace. I want too much harmony. I want too much happiness for you and for me to allow myself to hang out in those bad places for more than a very short time. So when I see other people hanging out there, or I hear questions from audience members about something that happened two or three years ago or, or you know, some event, I, it's very difficult for me not to say to them, are you still there? Are you really still hanging out with that? Is this the biggest concern of your life right now? Because I want to ask you, what are you doing to change the world? Or for that matter, what are you doing to evolve your own soul at the next level and take it to the next place? I don't say those things, of course, mm -hmm. in front of audiences. It's just what I would sometimes like to say, because sometimes I want to take the world itself. And go. Sure. <laughs> of course. <laughs> just shake it by the shoulders and say, time to wake up. I have to admit, to sometimes up. I want to do that to myself. Yeah. We'll take a break and come back for the last part of our interview with Neil. Welcome back, and we're in the last part of our interview with Neil. Neil, before we went to that last break, you were talking about, or you know, when I want to ask you about the most common questions that you were asked, and you know, there's this little voice in your head that's having another conversation with you rather than one that's coming out of your mouth. Why don't you actually sometimes say what's happening in here? Well, I have to, I have to uh, remind myself what I'm doing in the room. Yeah. You know, um, I have a statement that I've pulled out of A Course in Miracles that I use as the guiding principle of my life that says this, you are in the room to heal the room. You are in the space to heal the space. There's no other reason for you to be here. Mm. So I, I try to maintain um, my awareness of that and to make certain that whatever I'm saying or doing is at some level healing. And I don't think that criticism, even mild criticism, is necessarily healing. So I, uh, and I don't think that form is the proper form. I think individually, if I was sitting down with a person who came to me for individual advice or counseling, I surely would say that, because mm -hmm. I would say, well, you've asked me and I'll tell you. But uh, in, a, in an audience uh, with three or four or 500 people, it would not bring the highest benefit to that moment, in my assessment, uh, to say something that could be potentially embarrassing or mildly hurtful to that person, mm -hmm. uh, to call them out that way in, you know, in front of a whole room and say, why are you so involved with your own life in the, at, at that level? Um, so I have to look at you know, what it is I'm doing in, in the space. Uh, a great teacher once said to me, speak your truth, but soothe your words with peace. Oh, that's nice. Who was that? His name was Futsu Trion. He was a Chinese, he, he was an American person, but he was a, a, a member of a Chinese uh, movement of, toward mastery, body, mind, spirit, integration movement called Gon de Gao. He's left his body. Mm -hmm. uh, he had his uh, continuation day uh, a number of years ago. But when I knew him, he was a, a close uh, friend and a wonderful master. Uh, and uh, he said those words to me, and I never forgot them. Mm. Well, uh, just coming to the, ma the master bit, in uh, Tomorrow's God, when you talk about, you know, how do we attain self-mastery? And, and one of the things that was in there was we have three choices when we're confronted with behavior that's not supportive. And it was to either react, it uh, was to um, take it personally and be too sensitive, or to see that person as who they truly are on that, that higher level, which I guess is what you're saying when you're sometimes answering questions from an audience and you choose to see them at their highest level. Yes, you know, what can I add to this moment? Mm. You see, um, there's an old saying, no one comes to you without a gift for you in their hands. Mm -hmm. uh, Conversations with God has reversed that. What CWG uh, tells us is no one ever comes to you but that you have a gift for them in your hands. And I have always felt that way since, since my conversations with God material, that everyone who crosses my path has come to me to receive a gift from me for them. Mm 
My job is merely to figure out what it is. Mm -hmm. So when I'm listening to someone in an audience or engaging with anyone at any level, my first question has to be, if I had a gift for that person, whatever it might be, maybe it's just a smile as I walk past a, the receptionist at a bank or whatever, who knows what it might be, but a smile, a word of good cheer, a, a short compliment or something more significant. What gift could I bring to this moment that could cause that other person to have a deeper and richer and more present experience of who they really are? And am I prepared and ready and willing to give that gift? Or do I have to kind of worry about it or couch it or give it a second thought or wonder how they're going to receive it or, or worry about what I'm going to get back from it or how, how they're going to think of me or what they're going to think about me? Those things I don't even worry about anymore in that sense. So in, when I'm in front of an audience, I have to assess, is this the gift I came to give that person? What are the highest words I could say here that could lift that person into a new understanding and a brand new experience of who they really are? That, by the way, is what I think we can all do for all of humanity. You know, someone once asked me, well, you know, if, if uh, our life is not about our individual dramas, mm -hmm. if we're not supposed to be getting caught up in all these day-to-day -day things, then what is our life about? I mean, what are, what are we to do? What is the invitation? What is the challenge placed before all of humanity? I think the challenge before all of humanity and the opportunity and the invitation is for us to step into each moment and ask ourselves, what is my gift here that I can give to this moment? I asked God, Robin, in, in the early part of my dialogue, why isn't my life working? I don't understand why my life isn't working. I mean, nothing was working at that time. And God said to me, Neil, it's really quite simple. You think your life has something to do with you. But I'm here to tell you that your life has nothing to do with you. Read that no thing at all. Well, I said, well, how can that be? God said, well, you see, Neil, you are perfect and whole and complete just the way you're sitting there. And you think you're not. And that is the fiction. But the truth is that you're whole and complete and perfect just the way you're sitting there. You don't have to fix anything, change anything, or do anything to be utterly perfect in my eyes. Now, God said to me, Neil, I've told you that. I've told everyone else that, too. But I'm hoping that you will believe me so that you can spend the rest of your life reminding everyone else. Now, here's what's interesting, Robin, about that. As I've made the decision that my life has nothing to do with me and everything to do with everyone else, with giving the gift of people back to themselves, my life mission, incidentally, is to give people back to themselves, thus to change their mind about God, about life, and about each other. As I have embarked on that mission to give people back to themselves, all the things I thought that I had to work for and struggle and strain for that I wanted in my own life the love of others, a, a nice income, the things of life that make us all feel good, even good health. All those things have fallen down upon me without my even reaching for them because I've got that life isn't about me. And God says, oh, he gets that his life has nothing to do with him. Give him everything because <laughs> he's out there doing the work. Mm -hmm. So don't go around asking, what do we to eat? What are we to drink? Wherewithal will we clothe ourselves? Seek ye first what? the kingdom of heaven, and all else will be added unto you. Thus it has been written, and I think said very well, by all the masters through all the ages, each in their own way, and said again on this day. So powerful, so simple. It is simple. Life is extraordinarily simple, amazingly simple. Mm. We're making things very complicated here. We don't have to. But because of moments like this, because of programs like yours, because of your willingness to spend this kind of time sharing this message with the thousands of people who watch it, we have an opportunity to seek a newer world, to make it even a better place. So the world is grateful for the likes of you, I'm sure. Mm. Speaking of messages, thank you for that. What would be a message that you would like to leave with our viewers? Of those to whom much is given, much is asked. Look then to see what in each moment of your day-to-day -day life you can gift to the world 
that the world might heal itself at last. And what about for you? Say five years from now, what would you like to be doing, achieving? What would you like to see? I know that's kind of like <laughs> a dirt question. No, I... But let's put it out there. I, I, I hope that... I've thought about it, actually. Mm. It's not a bad question at all. Any thinking person would have to ask themselves that kind of a question. Mm. Uh, what I hope in five years will have happened is that I will have changed the world's mind about God, changed the world's understanding of what life is really about, and changed the way people interact with each other on this planet. That's a huge agenda. I mean, it's almost grandiose. Mm -hmm. uh, but Einstein, I think, is the one who said, if it's not impossible, it's not worth even attempting. <laughs> okay. How often would you be getting a little frustrated sometimes with us as a, a, uh, a collective and individually and just not getting the message? Sometimes you must get a little frustrated. Uh, about, about every 20 minutes. Oh, good to hear that. <laughs> no, I, I'm serious. Yeah, I'm I, 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 I said before, I'm a yeah. very, very normal person. Yeah. I walk out into the street and I look out my you know, car window as I'm driving by and go, what, what, are, they, what are they thinking of? What, what are they doing? I see people walking down the street, you know, smoking. I saw them coming into the studio here, smoking, you know, and, and I thought, why? I wanted to go walk up to them. Don't do that. Don't do that. Why would you do that to this beautiful, beautiful body? But it's not my place, you see. But I mean, you ask how many, you know, or I see people arguing on the street. A couple of days ago, I was in Canada and I saw two people at a shopping center, you know, arguing with each other. I just wanted to walk up to each other and say, don't do that. Don't do that. Stop it. But you know, I, I've done those things myself. This is the pot calling the kettle black. Mm. How do I dare say to someone else, don't do that, when I did all of those things and more? Mm. So when I move to that place of recognizing my own faults and foibles, then I have great compassion on all of us. And then I turn to God. God, bring us a message and a messenger who can cause all of us to stop this, all these things that we do, and live life as it was truly meant to be lived. And if I could add a little bit to that message, I'm glad I came here to this planet in this way at this time, and I'm very grateful. And on that note, Neil, I'm so grateful you've come on and being on this show. It's almost like Conversations with God meets Conversation with Robin. And there's a story behind that name for the show, by the way. It was not my choice, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, not my conscious choice, anyway. Thank you so much for, for being and sharing your wonderful knowledge and wisdom. Well, you're very kind. Thank you for having me here. And uh, maybe we'll have you on the show another time. I would love to do that. Thank you. I'd love to have you. And thank you for being with us. And uh, I hope you got as much out of this as what I did.